What's up? It's another video cast episode. We're talking about supporting local communities and larger communities through tabletop gaming. Super excited to be joined by Bruce today. We have a very special episode because what he does at Tabletop Game Alliance is very similar and in line with what we support as a tabletop game store, which is those positive aspects of tabletop gaming. Uh, tune into this episode to learn about some ways that he supports his communities and supports educators, librarians, a lot of cool stuff he does with Tabletop Game Alliance. So before we get into the episode, please drop a like, drop a subscription, leave a comment that really helps us out. We're still launching this video cast. We could really use some subscribers, so subscribe if you're tuning in for the first time, and we will go into the episode and the topic right now. All right, welcome to another episode episode of bge's tabletop talk i think i finally got that down i can say it correctly um this is another video cast episode and today i'm joined by bruce brown super excited to have him on the show he's down in texas he is the president of tabletop alliance he's doing some really awesome things to support communities and bring the hobby to more people um both in texas and nationwide but super excited to have bruce on the show today and we're going to talk about some of the things he's doing um bruce welcome to bge's tabletop thanks for having me dustin really appreciate you bringing me on and also kudos to you for all the cool things you're doing because i get to see all the fun stuff you're posting online um but for real quick for those not familiar with tabletop alliance we're actually a volunteer run 501c3 nonprofit organization and what we do is we further gaming in schools libraries community programs by sending out free game kits so any educator community leader or like community leader meaning maybe a boys and girls club hospital etc can sign up and we'll send them free games uh with and that is all because of the support of our amazing donors and uh partnerships with publishers and distributors. And over the last two years, we've actually been able to impact over 8,700 students from coast to coast across the U.S. through games. Um, so it's really, really cool volunteer work that we get to do. Uh, and then on top of that, we also work with some of those individuals to do some research. So I'm finishing a PhD in human resource development and work. my dissertation work is actually in nonprofit management. And so it's a really cool synthesis of these different elements of life and uh, gaming coming together in some really cool ways. That's super awesome. Um, I have some follow-up questions, but maybe yeah. I'll ask those in a second. We, I just want to kind of share Bruce's. We've done some things together before. Um, what, what have we all done together? We did the the a presentation at the Game Based Learning Alliance, and we talked about using yep. games for learning. Um, so that's a big thing of what you do too, and what we do. Um, so we got a lot yeah. in common. Yeah, that was a really fun presentation where we talked through. Uh, social emotional learning. Um, we also had Matthew Pinchuk from Canada on that as well. And we talked through how do you create learning outcomes based in actual results um, for social emotional learning um, and how to categorize the use of games. So that was just so much fun to work on with you. Yeah, that was, it was a lot of fun. I'm glad you kind of remembered the presentation because <laughs> my brain's a little foggy this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Awesome. It was a good time. So you mentioned you've you've helped impacted 8,700 uh, students. Do you have a number, your goal? Because uh, <laughs> for us, like I have this huge plan of impacting, well, impacting, selling 1 million games. Like that, that is my goal. Um, it's kind of like the, the idea of loving the process over the goal. So do you have a goal yeah. that you aim for? Or is that something you do? Yeah, so I wouldn't say it's a set number. Um, however, this year, because of the impact we've been able to have, we are shooting to impact 10,000 students by this year's end. And we currently have a campaign going on uh, with fundraising and different things that you can go to tabletopalliance.org to find out about and go check that out. So that way we can have the support to then go out and impact these 10,000 students through our network. Now, when I think about numbers, though, I would actually rather see a game in every school, a game in every library, um, a game in every hospital and, and community program, uh, because I think access to gaming is a really powerful thing. And so I don't have a set number on that because that's a giant number. Uh, mm. But I think that is more of what motivates us is to give access and opportunity to students all across the US. Yeah, and that's a huge thing is like, 
Well, yeah, I mean, I think you made a couple couple things I want to segue into is one, like access to gaming and how important that is and how we do that. And then also just what gaming does when you have that access to it. Um, yeah, we, we have a really generous anonymous donor who donates a grant to our, our store every quarter and we can support. I mean, it's we, we do $50 to two people every month so that's like super awesome if someone is just want to kind of dive into the hobby and it's it's something i always share with parents too like hey you want you want your kid to practice some writing skills go go on our website and answer these two questions i mean it's not like a huge essay they have to write but it's you know they have to think about their answers to these questions and mm -hmm. and so far i mean i'm kind of hesitant to say this but so far we've awarded every person who's applied because we just need more people to apply but well, I think that's really cool. And then I think you've got a, a double fake going on, right? So you're encouraging them to invest the time and energy to fill that out. But then we also look at like one of our guilds is Stefan with Unboxed Education in Austin. And he just did a presentation earlier this year with the um, International Library Association on increasing literacy through gaming, specifically D&D. Mm -hmm. &D. And Wizards of the Coast wow. has that pub published on their actual website for educator resources and support with some of the new stuff that they're got going on there too. So not only, Dustin, are you getting them in, but then they're having a, no a new literary journey and other things by based on what games they get after through that program. I think that's really cool. And if you're that supporter out there that's watching this, I just want to say you're doing some really cool things. So awesome job. <laughs> Yeah, and you mentioned literacy in D and D. Like, oh my gosh, it's huge for kids and wanting to read and write. And like, I've had some kids in our camp, and they, I can tell they need the extra practice writing and reading. And they'll actually take the time to learn how to spell words and copy down like their their equipment or their weapons and stuff. And then like, I, I'll have kids that you know, they, they're not super excited about reading, but we'll create their character and I'll say, okay, so your homework is to find three spells for your, like, your <laughs> wizard or whatever. And um, so they have to go home and they have to read through the spells because they have to choose the three that they want, right? They Love that. Yeah, it's it's cool. And not only are they learning English, or let's say, right, but they might be also learning Elvish. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's a really cool way to um, hoodwink that essentially assignment and bringing out some cool things for students and, and love that you're doing that Dustin. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some things you're doing with tabletop Alliance? I know I've kind of been watching some of your content and you've been doing the most recent content was your, your painting exercise. So, um, yeah. So that was actually for a board game podcast. I've been running mm. for like the last four years. Uh, just interestingly have multiple content streams. So that's probably why you're seeing that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I'm also the primary host and founder of um, Board Game Impact, which has over 10,000 downloads um, across all platforms, which is really, really cool to be able to say, because this is just something to say thank you to the hobby and use our educational based lenses in that in that way. Um, within Tabletop Alliance, what we've been doing is really working to spread awareness and spread into more schools. So like, um, spoiler alert, um, we just spread to New York last week. Um, so that's a new state on our radar. Nice. We actually, the, uh, the guild leader, so educators or community leaders who sign up, we call them guild leaders, and they're going to have their own lo local guild. And that's where their local impact really happens. And that's what adds up to our number of impact. Um, that person's actually an, a National Education Association um, fellow. So that's a NEA fellow with the U.S. government for this upcoming year. And so that's just like a really cool collaboration opportunity. We've been really leaning in on providing some data to back up these things now that we have a network. And so I've been working with some of our guilds to look at uh, where they're doing exit surveys based on mm -hmm. learning outcomes. And then I'm using my PhD side of life and running that through some intense statistical analysis. And so like I can say to you, last year, um, this one program that was doing that saw as students attended more sessions, the greater and greater learning attainment happened. And so the key is not just getting them in once and playing, but really engaging them over multiple iterations, right? And so games have a cool way of bringing people in and captivating them. And then we, if we bring them back week to week, we're going to see that improvement in terms of other elements of their education um, by them coming in and just having some fun. 
And so that's been cool to apply that research-based background to this um, and to help out in the literature and the support of this, right? Because as we grow, we want to then showcase the foundation and what's working. So that way we can do this more for more people. Right. And maybe you can share a little bit about the like what it looks like going to these kind of, I guess, the guilds with, I don't know if you would call it a club at school, probably depends on the school. But because when I'm hearing it, I'm thinking a couple different things. I'm thinking one, if it is content related, of course, that's going to impact how they learn, but also just like having an environment where they feel comfortable and safe is going to make them more comfortable going to that school as an overall like school culture, right? So what what is it like for a student to maybe go to one of these? I know there's several. I, I don't know how many states you're in now, but do you have like a, a maybe an experience you can share? Yeah. So I've got actually a quote from Nathaniel who sent me this last night. Nathaniel is a chemistry teacher, um, also the girls wrestling coach and the esports coach as well for the school. And this is in Texas. Um, but Nathaniel runs a gaming club after school. And by the way, when I talked learning outcomes before, I was actually not talking educational, like for a social studies class or a math class. I was actually talking social emotional learning. So mm. how are students developing in themselves, in their relations to other people, and the way that they can communicate across difference um, and their own self-actualization and management of stress. Those kind of learning outcomes is what was being assessed. Um, but Nathaniel wrote, um, so over the last few years, having a game club at her school, I've seen so many students find a safe place that they could have fun, enjoy social interaction with other kids that have the same interest. It has made lots of kids come out of their shell and help me make make and nurture new friendships that they would not have found otherwise. Having this place to come together has made these types of friendships more accessible for introverted kids that may not have found others to play games with that they love. Mm, and I got that awesome. email last night and it's just like, that just warms my heart to hear that the work we're doing or getting to support of these amazing educators. Cause like, here's the deal. I am not the one in that classroom, right? Nathaniel's in that classroom. We're mm -hmm. here to further the work they do and because we know that education and community programs like are scraped together. Usually they are underfunded. And so we want to do everything we can to empower these amazing people and also to raise the voice of this cool work and how can we bring them together. And so to get this from Nathaniel, it just warmed my heart so much. Um, and I'm very, very thankful to hear that this is kind of the impact that they're seeing. And this is a school in Texas. That's super awesome. Yeah. I mean, you and he mentioned Nathaniel mentions about like having the opportunity to grow relationships. And that's one thing that like gaming's really fantastic at doing. Um, maybe we can shift gears a little bit because it makes me wonder about you. And I kind of asked this question to you before. Have you been on the receiving end of like um, gaming impacting your life? Yeah, I, I have. Um so for me, I have lived all across the U.S. and I've been very privileged to actually have visited all seven continents in my life. And so with that, I grew up in the East Coast, went to school in Texas, did my master's in Ohio, moved out to California, and now I'm back in Texas. So in a very like nebulous way, games has kind of been the through line for me of experience. So like playing games as an early, like early, I'm talking like risk and monopoly, of course, and some Stratego. And then I remember in my master's program when I had this awakening of games. Um, so I was in Ohio and hurricane Sandy had just hit the East coast. And then if all the trucks in the Midwest went to the East coast to go and help on the East coast, and what happened though, Sandy came inland all the way into the Midwest and knocked out all of our power. So we were without power, heat, hot water, anything for 120 hours. And in that time, we, I was working in on a university campus and living on a university campus. We were the only support system for the students on that campus. And so what we did every day from like 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. was we went to the lobbies of these buildings for these students who are stranded just like us without power, without water, um, all these different things and set up a home base. And all we did was really play hobby games together. And that really clicked into me. I mean, I, I don't can't even count the number of times I probably played Catan in that week because we were <laughs> down everything for a week. But that yeah. made the, made me realize there's so much more to this hobby. Right. And then with that, 
it created a safe space and a community for these students who were literally stranded. And so that was just really cool. And then moving to Texas, we were able to get plugged into games. And on a personal note, just got to share this. Um, my wife and I actually met in a kid's toy store. Um, we met in the Lego aisle, not the game aisle, but she was running the toy store. And so games have had a pretty profound part of my life. Had I not been comfortable with myself as a gamer, I probably wouldn't have gone in that store and then wouldn't have mm. met my best friend and my wife, right? And so, yeah, games have been, played an integral role in my life and that, that is me and it's going to play out differently for different people, right? I'm sure you have right. your own story as well. And we just want to foster opportunities for other people to have access to these really cool things. Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking about also like my experience with kids and even adults in our store like what i mentioned also that gaming grant one person who applied he's gonna host his first dungeon dungeon and dragon session in our store love that and like yeah it's and he's been able to kind of meet new people and we have we, we have one group we had our, our dm come the very first week we did dnd he was our first dm and he had a group of people and it's the same group since april like the same same group they're all like friends now and they're playing together. like yeah it's super cool to see see how games impact people and then we have also a uh, co-worker or like a, a staff she met like some of her best friends through D D, and she is Love planning it. to go to the netherlands because of dungeon and dragons and like live and do her graduate studies there so oh, yeah wow. it's, <laughs> gaming is like huge um yeah so can you share a little bit more about like i know you do uh you send like boxes out to schools and what are some other things you do yeah so it kind of comes twofold it really depends on the person right so each entity and con uh, context matters. So there might be an educator or community leader who this is their first time ever using games, period. Um, they've been, hey, I want to do this. I want, I noticed my students, um, especially in post COVID of people having not interacted. They're like, I need something to help bring my students together and, and actually talk uh, for a change and maybe not text all the time um, and have that common interaction that's analog. So we have definitely had some people like that where it's like, I am just invested and I want to see this happen. And on the other end of the spectrum, we've also got educators and community leaders who are like, hell yeah, I've been doing this for, um, for a long time. And we just want to help amplify what they're already doing. Mm. And so it depends on where they're at in their journey. The commonality though, and the, we, it's the sad part is a lot of these, po the, a lot of these entities are just essentially in pockets. And so what we've been doing is every time a guild comes on, they're getting a phone call from me. And what I do is like, I talk through like, Hey, what's your context? We get to understand them and know them. And then we'll connect them with different people, right? So there was a high school that wanted to bring some games into a certain kind of context. And so I was like, okay, let's call Max. Max is in Pennsylvania and he's going to help share. So essentially connecting educators and developing a network of resources within one another. Because we, we essentially work as the facilitation to help those conversations happen for whatever outcome they're looking to achieve. So it's very customized, but on a holistic scale. Cool. And I have two questions, maybe a quick yeah. one, but then a more leading discussion. How would, if someone's interested in joining, how would they apply? Yeah, it's super easy. Um, so we just want to know a little bit about you because um, sadly in this world, like some people might just fill out the form to just get some games. So mm -hmm. we just want to have a little bit of verification. So all you need to do is go to tabletopalliance.org. You're going to click get involved. It's a little menu bar. And the first thing is register a game group. That's it. And that has just some information on what we provide. And then it has the form. It's going to ask you basic things. What's your name? Um, what is the address we would send things to? Tell us a little bit about your context. Is there a secondary person that also kind of helps you with this? What's their contact information? And that's it. Like uh, Those are the questions. We just want to understand what you're doing and then what you're looking for, because that helps inform our conversation when we call you. Nice. Pretty simple. Yeah. Um, my other question. So you have like maybe a teacher or an, or an organization leader who is unfamiliar, like very new to gaming. 
Yeah. They, you know, they played Monopoly and they think, <laughs> okay, we can, we can run a Monopoly club at our school or, you know, they're on that level, like where sure. they don't maybe know that there's a lot of other opportunities with other games they can run in their, their organization. How do those people find you or how do you find those people? Sure. So it's somewhat on a referral basis um, of, hey, do you know people who would be great at this? And so if mm. you're watching this right now, side note, and you're like, oh, this educator would be amazing at this, uh, encourage them to just go to the website and fill it out. And so that way we can get in contact with them and we'll take that journey. Now, you bring up a good point, though, and that is that different people are on different parts of their gaming journey, right? And so what we do is actually I e emailed Rodney Smith of Watch It Played. And whenever we send out a guild kit, that's what we call the boxes we send out. I actually send them an email with um, the links to like the watch it played videos or other things, because I also don't want to assume that that educator has ever seen these games. Right. Mm, and so right. I want to provide them a resource that they can send out to their students. Hey, here's the games you got coming in. Watch this video and then you'll know how to play that when you show up to game club this afternoon or in this different context. So when we, whenever we are sending out stuff, we definitely include an email to them as well with here's what we're sending you. And then here are some resources to use that so that way you can get it to the table more efficiently and faster in the correct way. That's awesome. And then I'm just more curious from my end, like yeah. how many, how many educators are more doing like uh, tabletop games or yeah. role playing games or even collectible card games like what what's kind of the ratio sure so collectible card games is not necessarily an area that we dive into as much um, because it's we want to provide something that's more in perpetuity be able to support uh, but we what's really interesting is in when we got started so 2020 to 2021 we we got all these games right and we're like okay we think it's going to be more board game heavy and people coming back mm. actually it was more rpg heavy um that year uh, which makes sense because people were still hopping in hybrid and they can mm. continue operations while virtual it did, that doesn't matter yeah um what's interesting though is this year it's hardcore board gaming and so i'd say <laughs> last year is all rpg and this year is all board gaming with a, obviously a couple crossovers in between mm. yeah interesting that's yeah that's cool i know like for me i've i've been playing more rpgs probably since we opened the store than board games just because i'm dming a lot <laughs> so yeah and i've actually like i like i really like role-playing games i didn't realize how much i enjoy them maybe dming them i don't know i've i've only played in them a, a few times and it was when i was very early and didn't know what i was doing so i need to try to jump back into rpgs um, and so for rpgs specifically we're honestly talking D, &D typically mm, um, okay. uh, because a it's more recognizable to a student yeah. and so we want to have that hook of like oh i've seen that on insert tv show here or talked about and so although it might not be always the most user friendly because of mm. the amount of text and things like that we found that there's a greater investment for people like, oh, I'll, I'll invest the time or look into some stuff because of it being D&D. &D. Um, so I just wanted to clarify what role-playing systems we're sending out right now. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's a big whole conversation about marketing and role-playing yeah. games. And like, even on our end, when we get people that want to play D&D, &D, like d and is awesome and it's really fun, but like, I probably wouldn't introduce someone who's never played an RPG to D and D first if I had the option, but they're not gonna take that, right? They know right. D and D. They that's they what want they want to do. <laughs> yeah, and then the, usually they're they're happy and they're excited, yeah. but it does like it takes you you need to sit down for like two hours to really kind of learn the game and get your character built, and then finally you're ready to play. And as you're playing, you're still learning a lot. But what's helpful in the last two weeks, Wizards of the Coast put out that educator page um, yeah. that actually has resources to like, hey, if, you're, if you've are if you never done this before, here is some resources on how to run a campaign or run a one shot um, that are really cool. So um, Wizards of the Coast like just put this out in the last two weeks, and I commend them uh, for doing that. Yeah, I'm going to try to pull that up. Here, because I I looked at it and I was super impressed. Like, you don't see game companies put together something that is very like well built for an educator. It's 
yeah. you know i've i've seen it a handful of times and i think another one was um smirk and daggers game about oil about spilling oil i don't remember the name of the game uh, I, rem- I remember it though yeah peak oil educator. i think what it was yeah like yeah the resources were really good too but like this is this is fantastic like it's mm-hmm. a great pdf um I don't know if I can pull up the PDF, but there's, like, there's a learning bunch of PDFs. outcomes. There's uh oh, it's gonna learning outcomes. There's like lesson plans. There's step by step. There's like one page handouts for doing stuff. Um, really cool. Maybe yeah, so they partner with up, but... yeah they partner with a couple different groups to make this happen, um, which is really cool. And I love the fact that we were sending stuff out. And then they did this after and when we've been reaching out to them. So I just love that of like, let's work together as a community and, and kind of bring us all into a community uh, together. Right. Um, so I love that these things are out there and we just want to help connect educators and community leaders with them. So that way they can do even, do even greater work in their communities. Cause it is such a under thanked area of our, of the world. Um, but they're having such a critical impact. Yeah, and it's, I mean, we talked about this a while back, like it's its really penetrating the market about this too, because it's not something that is a huge thing that people know about. And what was maybe a happy accident was the pandemic and the opportunity for schools and admin and teachers. Well, I think teachers always knew that SEL was important, but yeah. now there's a stronger push for it. And I think from the business side, Wizards of the Coast sees this as a great opportunity. Role-playing games are really fantastic for social emotional learning. Like one of the, I would say, maybe I'm biased. I would say one of the best resources for social emotional learning is our tabletop role-playing games. And I would, I would agree. I think both do it differently, right? So like, I think the hierarchy would probably be role-playing games than board games, but they're different in their own respects. Oh yeah. Where like, board games you're more managing your processes and managing your emotions in those situations role-playing games give you the opportunity for cognitive deference and so it gives you an opportunity to play a character that is not you and there if you do something wrong well i didn't do that wrong my character did that wrong and so there's a greater opportunity for students to kind of lean into moments where they might feel failure because mm. it's not them, it's the character. And the character is learning. The character can evolve from week to week, etc. cetera. Right. Um, I can apologize as a character to your character mm. um, and kind of play out these things instead of it being me and that's on me now forever, or quote unquote. And to like, let's think of it like high schoolers, things like that. It's like, oh my God, this is going to be me forever. And it's like not, <laughs> um, but it gives them an opportunity to have a little bit of dissonance from um from the situation yeah and it's really really excellent to see groups of kids play together and kind of navigate their comfort in the group like what is our group what does our group want to do and how do i as a player and also just sure we're all kind of having a good time and working together and and uh slaying dragons (laughs) yeah and i think one of the greatest introductions there um, that's really been helping is the idea of the X card. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm. Yeah. So there's a, essentially this idea that essentially you just put out a card that has an X on it. And if at any time someone doesn't feel comfortable with the content or the way the story is going, they, they don't have to say anything about why, and they're expected not to actually, mm. they could just tap the card and then all of a sudden, okay, let's just change topics. Um, yeah. that's not going to be something we talk about. And so at, if, since there's that now built in thing and I've seen it actually in some games. So the game like for the queen, which is a very light role playing game, very light. You can play it in about a half an hour. It's a deck of cards and you just read the prompts. There's an X card in that and it's part of the game. Um, So there's these nice adaptions that have happened to kind of foster really safe environments for testing out of these different skill sets. For sure. For sure. There's a lot of like safety tools for role playing games. I know we do, well, we did, and then we're going to do in Halloween again, Mothership, which is like a sci-fi horror RPG. And yeah. so I send out a survey to my players beforehand, and I don't know who coined the term, but it's like a windows, veils, and lines. And like a window is, or door maybe, I don't know, window or door, whatever. Um, but it's like things that are like 100%, you can do that as much as you want. Veil is like, 
uh, yeah, we can kind of do that, but I'd prefer we don't like describe it in detail. And then the line is like, do not do that. Like, yeah. I'm not comfortable with that in my game. Um, but yeah, that's those are some cool things. Um, yeah. So we're, we're, we're going getting close on time. So before yep. we kind of go into our game, do you have like anything else you want to share with our audience? Um, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for also just this opportunity to come and talk about this. Like this is the stuff that really fills our buckets and we're just so thankful to get to do this. And so definitely make sure to encourage you to go and learn more about us. Please encourage um, different educators and community leaders to hop on. That community leader part is kind of one of the most misunderstood. And so I just want to lean in there. So it's really any context of using games with students. Um, may that be in a hospital, may that be like a boys and girls club. We want to support you in that work. And so as you're watching this and want to be interested in that, just reach out to me and we'll see what we can do to help you as well. Um, and so that's been kind of the one thing of like, Hey, I really don't understand this. Education is pretty clear cut lines of mm. educators, librarians, but the community side is the harder one to pin down, but we're just here right. for gaming with students, period. Uh, that's the best way to put that. Awesome. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll, come back to where people can find you too but tabletopalliance.org uh, yep. but we'll we'll kind of wrap up at the end um, yep. and we're going to play a game we kind of talked yeah. about this before we have not played this game on the video cast at least not BG tabletop talk I think maybe we played it on board game with education our old port podcast uh, but it's called super fight um, I think a lot of people are familiar with this game even like people who are not super familiar with hobby board games um, cause it's, you know, you it's, it's been at target for a long time. It's at mm -hmm. like those novelty gift shops in the mall, like Spencer's hot topic. <laughs> You'll find it there. Um, but essentially we're going to play it a little bit different. Um, you get a draw, we're going to draw a card and this is this, like the main person, like the first one is Hannibal. Hannibal, can you see that? Can't see that. It out of focus okay. uh, that's fine well you just well, tell me it. i'll just tell you yeah <laughs> yeah you know, if you're listening on the podcast you'll you can hear it anyways so let's see i'm gonna draw one one person or well, two people and then we're gonna add two characteristics to that person so the first one is a giraffe okay <laughs> we got a giraffe and these people are gonna fight and bruce and i are gonna talk through who we think would win and then at the end we're going to reveal our answer or should we talk through it? Or should we just reveal our answer? I think we should try and make the case for either one. Okay. And then we're going to oh, okay. pick. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, you don't know which way we're going to vote yet. <laughs> and then we'll have uh, three, two, one, say it at the same time. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, a giraffe wearing a jet pack and has a six foot neck so I, is that I a 12 foot neck <laughs> yeah. Yeah. okay well, or is that just neck. normal giraffe i think i think let's say it's like an, a super neck giraffe so it's got a super neck <laughs> um and then we got we got to pick a movie character Ooh. yeah let's do that do you got a character that you want to choose Ooh. uh the da, most da, da, da. recent movie you've seen most recent movie I've seen, I was watching Lord of the Rings last night. So I'd say, let's go with Legolas. Um, I don't know who she, that's, that's the main that's character. That's the archer, the, um, the elf ranger. Is she the main character he in the first is, episode? He is. Well, he. Lord of the Rings, the movie, um, the movie series, uh, the actual. So we were watching Return of the King last night. Oh, so okay. Movie. Okay. I kind of remember him. Or you want to oh. go with a, with Bilbo. Um, okay, let's Frodo. do Bilbo. Let's okay. do Bilbo, because I know Bilbo okay. for sure. Okay. All right. And Bilbo riding a broomstick. Okay. <laughs> that can't stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what do you think? Who would okay. win this fight? Well, I think, I think to make my case for both of them. Yeah. So first of all, we got a flying theme going on overall. Yeah. Uh, we got the jetpack. Right. But we also have the riding a broomstick. One is going to be loud and the other one's going to be most likely silent with that broomstick. Okay. Um, now with the giraffe, I think that the ability to fly around, right? So you, it, it trees expect the giraffe. They do not expect the super giraffe, nor do they expect the super giraffe with a jetpack. <laughs> so it is reaching some new heights of, for the giraffe kind. 
in a very yeah. cool way. I think Bilbo riding that broomstick, and I envision, envision the laughing like a cackling, like ha ha ha, um, almost as if he was reliving some of his adventures. And he just sometimes gets up to no good. He definitely like messed around with the dragon and different things. And so him on flying around, uh, just and sometimes turning invisible because he already had that power um, with the ring. Um, I mm-hmm. think could be a super powerful thing. Okay, I like agree with everything you say. I think the biggest thing for me is how this jetpack operates. Is it like a jetpack like we see today that's like flying over water and you can't maneuver it very well or is it a jetpack like from the future and it's like you can you know do some crazy tricks with it Um, yeah the jetpack we always wanted or the jetpack where it's attached to every ligament of your body yeah to keep yourself stable (laughs) yeah yeah so it's it's i think it comes down to that um okay so on the count of three, this is how we're playing our, this game. And at home, there's a lot of different ways you can play Super Fight. But at home, you kind of you choose some characters. Um, and then you each get to add one char- characteristic from your hand. And then the other player plays a characteristic on your superhero. So it's like a good one and usually like a bad one. And then they fight another character. So And then you kind of have to judge. The judge chooses which one um, based on your argument. But for us, we're going to say our answer at the same time. And if we say the same answer, we win. If we say different answers, we lose. Um, So we'll do it on the count of three. And to answer, you'll just say giraffe or Bilbo, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. So we'll go three, two, one, and then say it. So three, two, one, Bilbo. Bilbo. Okay. (laughs) There's a little (laughs) delay, but (laughs) (laughs) all right. We we won. We won. Nice. Yeah, I think the jetpack... And then yeah. the giraffe just is too much of a target, right? Exactly. I was like, big. Bilbo's small. It's a hobbit. It's tiny. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was that was my like pocket thing of yeah, giant cool. giraffe or small Bilbo. Yeah, that's funny. That's that a fun cool. game. I like yeah. playing it. I I like these games, but the the challenge for me is like having an end time for them because yeah. sometimes they they wear their. What do you? I don't know what that phrase is, but um, because but some people just love it and they can play for like four hours at the same game. It's, I mean, it's like, a cool experience. And I'm like, I'm yeah. not gonna lie. It's like I want to find another one, but it's like <laughs> we're right. up on time. But yeah, it's always a cool experience because you can also try, like tell a story. I don't know about you, but I had a story going on in my head of mm. watching a a giraffe and like immediately when you said jetpack, I'm like, where is it wearing the jetpack? Is it on its back? Is it <laughs> yeah. up its neck? <laughs> it's kind of like the debate on how do dogs wear pants? Is it all yeah. four legs or is it the up back like bottom half? <laughs> yeah. um, so it's very cool that even in this very short and simple experience, we're able to kind of cultivate those creativity elements. And have that play out in a fun way. And then um, let's just call this too. It also offered the opportunity for ownership and sharing out of ideas. And so part of the game being you need to talk about why you think it's winning, mm-hmm. right? right? That's a really cool thing of, hey, I, here's these prompts very quickly put together. Let's now jump into this. That's true. And going kind of back to our whole whole conversation about like education and just being comfortable like in the classroom. Sometimes you have to share your opinions and you have to be comfortable with putting them out there and maybe some people disagreeing. Yeah. And that's the whole nexus of this game is really let's offer opportunities for communication and, and debating in a, in a healthy and cathartic way. Right. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you so much, Bruce, for coming on the show today. If people wanted to reach out to you again, where can they find you? Yeah. So our website, which is also where you can request a guild kit and also just sign up to be part of our network or join the newsletter. That's tabletopalliance.org. We're also on all the social media. Um, So on Instagram, that's uh, tabletop.alliance. Facebook is Tabletop Alliance. And then Twitter is tabletop501c3. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much, Bruce. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yeah. Looking forward to it, Dustin. Thanks for having me on. Yeah.